Me presented by Noah Silas. This is a 45 minute talk with five minutes at the end reserved for Q&A. Uh, please extend a warm welcome to Noah. So howdy everyone. Um, as has been said, my name is Noah Silas. Uh, I'm an engineer at Causes, um, where we try and change the world, um, creating tools for activists. Um, and so it's uh, kind of this fun site to create uh, change in the world. Um, but before I was there, I was the head architect at a company called Mahalo, uh, where I met Jacob Birch, who's the co-author of this talk and whose name appears in all of your lovely programs. Um, he's currently an engineer at Revolution Systems, but uh, when we were at Mahalo together, we had a lot of occasions to make lots of mistakes as we built high volume systems. And so I'm here to share a lot of my mistakes and challenges with you so that hopefully you can go on and make your own new, innovative, entirely exciting and brand new mistakes. Hopefully you can come and share them with me later so that we can keep like this dialogue going and it'll be a fantastic learning experience for everyone. Um, so what we're gonna talk about here, uh, I'm gonna give you a, a brief introduction to caching. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on this because this is kind of a, a little bit of a more intermediate level talk. Um, we'll talk about the big picture considerations of a caching architecture. So as you start designing your system, what you should think about, uh, especially when you're first starting to get into caching, and then maybe some tips and techniques for you to use as you go and refactor your existing code. We'll talk about some common cache patterns, uh, some things you can think about that maybe you're doing and maybe you will like to start doing. And we'll talk about some implementation best practices, um, some things you can really concretely do in your code. Um, there's some things we won't spend a lot of time talking about in this session. Um, we're not gonna talk about backend tuning uh, so there's a whole lot of different backends you can use. We're not going to have the debates over Redis, Memcached. Um, really, this is about your application level concerns. Um, and we could have an entire talk about Redis and Memcached and Memcached slab allocation size and how to optimize that. And so we're just going to kind of skip over all of that. Um, we're not going to spend much time talking about upstream caches. This is a, a set of tools that you can use um, that will introduce a layer of caching to your app that your application almost can completely be ignorant of, that is just going to kind of this, be this man in the middle, essentially, between the outside world and your application. Um, we're also not going to talk about the Wu-Tang Clan, so I'm sorry if I've lured you in here with a title that was misleading. Um, so uh, the kind of big picture overview is what is caching? The idea is that we take some kind of expensive or difficult to compute result. And we're gonna store the result, and then the next time we try and invoke a function that is going to compute this, we can simply use the computed result from the last time we ran the function. We usually store these results in some kind of in-memory key value store. Um, so this is, you know, we, we know disk IO is slow, so we don't wanna put this like into a file on the disk. We wanna try and keep these into our main memory in ways that are gonna make it really fast to access on subsequent tries. Um, and so we're gonna use this to speed up your applications, and we're gonna use this to lighten load on the other systems that you're interacting with, like your database or third-party APIs. So here's the kind of common way that you will see people doing caching. Here we have some function that does work. The first thing we do in this function is we compute some cache key based on the arguments to the function. Uh, and we try and use this key as essentially an index into a giant hash table to get any previous results of this function's invocation. Um, so that's this line here where we get these results from the cache. Um, if the cache comes back saying, none, I don't have an answer for this, then we'll go ahead and perform this expensive calculation that will return a result. And we'll set that result into the cache so that the next time this function is invoked, we can skip this expensive calculation entirely. So that's the, the basic high-level overview of what is caching and how do we do it. Um, so as you're thinking about doing this in your own application, we have one rule that you want to follow. And that rule is there are no rules. There's some principles. And we're gonna give you some tools that you can use here, but remember, you guys are building these applications, and so you need to be willing to take what I'm talking about and use it in whatever way is gonna work for you. Uh, I am not an authoritative figure by any means, so please um, take everything I say and uh, use what works for you and call me out if I'm saying something that's completely wrong. Um, so we're gonna start with some assumptions, um, and then what we want you to do is look at your application in particular and benchmark it, profile it, think really hard about what's going on there, and what are the best ways that you can uh, improve the performance of your individual application. Um, so the best way to know which principles you're going to want to break is to plan ahead. And the best way to plan ahead 
is to ask yourself a bunch of questions. You don't need to even answer all these questions right away, but think about things like, which uh, operations am I performing that are going to be expensive? How long can my data be stale in a cache? How much data am I going to be caching? Um, this one is kind of hard to evaluate, but it's a really important question. Uh, if you know how much data you're going to be caching, you can um, apportion your servers appropriately and kind of tune the amount of memory that you've got available. If you overestimate, if you think you're going to need way more data than you actually do, um, you're going to end up spending a lot of money on expensive RAM, uh, big servers that maybe you don't need, and so you can maybe save yourself some money here. But if you underestimate, then you're going to end up with a situation where your cache becomes almost useless as keys are put into and evicted uh, from your cache very quickly. Um, even things, questions like, what's my physical data center? What's, what's my topology like of my network? If you're in one data center, your caching strategy might be very different than if you are on a bunch of different EC2 availability zones. Um, so think about kind of all of these things as you're planning your caching protocol. Um, and the really most important question to ask yourself is, do I really need this? Caching adds a lot of complexity to your code. Um, and sometimes it does this in these places where you don't necessarily expect it to. Uh, so you can think about things like, what's this going to do to my network traffic if I have a cache server that is doing a lot of constant communication? Um, remember that this is potentially introducing this new point of failure. And so if you are relying on your cache being up, then if the memcache server goes down, then what's that going to do to your application? And remember that all of these new code paths that you're introducing are in your most performance sensitive code because that's where you're going to want to introduce caching first so you'll have the best performance enhancement. Um, and so as you're thinking about this, remember that modern databases are stupidly optimized. We've spent many, many years figuring out all the best tips and tricks to get every inch of performance out of something like Postgres or MySQL. So before you start thinking about this, you know, try and take a minute, see if you can tune your database and just avoid this problem altogether. Um, so before you start using caching, now that you've thought about all this, remember there are only two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. I couldn't go through this talk without bringing up this quote, right? This is like the famous quote. Um, so here is the way that we can kind of help you move on from this. Your application should never rely on caching. Never. Don't do this. So your application is relying on your cache. We know you guys are building new, innovative, expensive, fantastic tools, products, applications, and you're trying to do this on a budget. So you are trying to relieve load on your databases by throwing a cache server in there. Um, but if you're relying on your cache, there's one thing that becomes the most important concern, which is your cache availability. So you start looking at ways that you can mitigate having one server that is your cache server, ways that you can avoid delegating all of these expensive calls to this one machine. Uh, and there's a technique that's really valuable for this that's called consistent hashing. So the idea with consistent hashing is that you can shard your data across a series of different cache servers. Um, so the kind of naive way to do this is given a cache key, let's take a hash function. We're really good at hash functions. We're computer scientists. Uh, and we can hash the key into an integer. And we can modulo this by the number of cache servers you have available and use this to distribute uh, these across that number of servers. Um, but this has some problems. Uh, the first thing that's a big deal is what happens when you add a server? Um, so imagine that you go from two to three servers with this kind of a scheme. Um, in an ideal world, you would think, OK, well, I've reallocated one third of my cache keys from different servers to a new server. And so I'd expect one third of my cache uh, ex results to be misses as they hit this new server that has no results in it. Um, but in this case, you're actually going to have a 66% miss rate um, based on the way that these, this algorithm is going to apportion keys between the servers. Uh, and in fact, it gets worse the more servers you have. If you go from 9 to 10 servers and you are using this algorithm, you're actually going to invalidate 90% of your cache. Uh, this is just based on keys shuffling as the number of servers, which is your module here, changes. So consistent hashing is great because it gives us this magical 1 over n. This is how many of your keys are going to get reapportioned. The rest stay on whatever server they're on. And to do this, we introduce a concept called the ring. 
Um, the ring is a visualization of the range of your hash function. So just imagine that this is your number line. We've got zero up at the top. And it's, it's like a clock, right, where the numbers count all the way around the clock, and then you get back to zero at the end. Um, so if this was a 64-bit address space, you can imagine that right before zero, you have two to the 64th. Um, so you place your servers on arbitrary points on this ring. So in this case, we have two servers, A and B. And then when we want to look up a key on this ring, uh, we hash the key in the same way that we hashed these servers onto the ring. Um, we find the point on the ring and kind of just follow this ring until we come to the next server. So in this particular example, we have a key K that hashes onto the ring. We find the next server on the ring, which is server B. So in this case, this, we see we've kind of divided the distribution here in half um, using one point on the ring for each server. But what we're actually going to do to make consistent hashing work is we're going to put each server on the ring many times. Uh, in this case, I've just illustrated it with five for ease of display. Um, but in actuality, you could put each server on this ring hundreds of times. And this way, you get this kind of random distribution. Um, so if you do something like take the host name of your cache server, uh, append an integer to it, right? So you've got server 1, 1, server 1, 2, server 1, 3. Um, and you can do this you know, 100 times and get different keys that will hash to different values on this ring. Um, but so we distribute these all over the place. Um, and so now, when we want to add a new server to the ring, we just insert its key points all around. And we do this enough times that we approximate 1 over n of the ring being consumed by each server. Um, so every time you add a point to this ring, you're just kind of delegating the points from there to the next point on the server to this or on the ring to this server. So this is this is really great um, because now when a server gets added, we're only claiming one over end of the ring, um, and with enough points here, when a server goes down, then the that load gets distributed equally across all the rest of the servers that are in your cluster. And there are some neat tricks you can do with this. Um, when you're bringing up a new server, you can do this kind of in this piecemeal way where you insert just a couple points at a time so it takes on a real small part of the cache space. And then as you scale up the number of points that the server has, it will slowly kind of eat more of this cache space. So the number of um, misses that you're going to have at any point is proportional to the number of uh, points you've added on the ring. Um, and you can tune your cache cluster capacity. Um, so if I have one server that has twice as much memory available, I can just put twice as many points onto the ring. And in this way, I can delegate different proportions of the cache cluster space to different servers. Um, that's a repeat. So we've got some common cache patterns that we're going to talk about now. Um, the first one is this kind of really just awesome tool that you've got. It's called memoization. And this isn't using any kind of cache server. This is just storing the results of these expensive computations inside your Python process. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. One of the great things about this is that it's really easy to write a decorator that you can just apply to any function that's in your code and will take the results of function calls and just return them if this function has been called with those arguments before and then um, try it again. Uh, but this is also something that a lot of your frameworks are going to already do for you. Uh, for instance, Django query sets have a result cache. So if you try and do a database query with a Django query set, uh, the first time it will query the database. And the second time you try and iterate over that same query set, it just uses its internal cache, um, which is a memoized version. Um, so this is, this is a great pattern that's really easy. The kind of hard part about this is that you have to be aware of this state that exists inside your application. And sometimes it's difficult to debug if you don't recognize that certain functions are being memoized. If this isn't a common pattern in your application, if this is only a couple places, you have to be really explicit and clear so that the rest of your developers know when there's weird, wacky results coming back, here's where you can look for them uh, inside the actual process. Um, another pattern that you'll encounter is that you've got just a few expensive operations. Um, so things that come up. You'll find a lot of roll-up values if you've got uh, things that are doing summations across a table or counts. Um, these are a great opportunity for you to turn this into a cached result. Um, anything that's doing joins, if you've got rows in your database or, or tables in your database that have millions of rows, um, doing cross products of these tables can be really painful and really expensive uh, time-wise. And so that's a great candidate for these kinds of caching. Um, anytime you're doing external service calls, if you are trying to 
convince Google that your page is dynamic and so you're just sticking your tweet updates into the sidebar of your site. You don't want to be calling Twitter every time a page gets loaded. Um, this is going to be really expensive and really slow and your page performance will suffer. So instead you can just call your Twitter API once, get your tweet stream and then store it locally in your cache and then insert that into pages on every load. Um, so the great thing about when you've only got a few of these that are expensive operations is that the cache invalidation is relatively easy. You only have a couple operations that you're caching. You can keep track of all of them manually. Um, so this isn't so bad, but the cost of one of these keys falling out of your cache, it's way big. It's expensive. Um, and the reason for this is because you can become subject to something called the thundering herd. So the thundering herd is what happens when many requests try and get the same key at once. Um, and so suppose that we've got this Twitter API call that is going to take a second um, because we're have some kind of latency bottleneck going on. And it's in the sidebar of every one of our pages, and we're a site that's under load. So when this cache key falls out, uh, we have every request that's going to come in in this second before the first request will finish restoring this value and putting it back into the cache. Uh, every request in that period is going to be invoking this function that's expensive. Um, and this makes you sad. Your databases can start suffering if this is uh, something that's doing complica complicated joins or uh, you know, counts, sums, averages, all these kinds of expensive queries. Um, third party APIs might start rate limiting you. Uh, you'll start getting all kinds of sad face times as you interact with other providers. Um, you might even kind of subject yourself to your own internal DDoS as your uh, servers all start hammering one particular service that is handling whatever this uh, expensive piece is. Um, and so this is a result of this uh, caching pattern that we've used for a long time, where you start by figuring out how long a piece of data can be stale, right? So in the case of our, our example sidebar with this Twitter stream, you say, I don't update Twitter more than once an hour. I can just call Twitter once an hour. Uh, and then so you cache the data with a timeout of this uh, to value, right, in our, an hour, a day, whatever you decide is the appropriate amount of time that this thing can be stale. And then you just let that fall out of the cache and it expires. And then when someone makes a request that requires this piece of data, you recompute it immediately. Um, so in this case, you don't worry about invalidation. That's great. And validation is hard. Um, but what's going on here is if your system is under load, you, oh, what you've really done is you've reinvented cron. You wait an hour, the result falls out of the cache, and if you're under load, someone is going to be the next request, and at that point, this thing starts happening again. Um, so we have great tools for this. We have cron. We have all kinds of better, shiny, new widgets uh, that will do things in time series for you. Um, so this is, this is not the way to do it. Instead, we're going to try and use the new hotness, uh, where you cache forever and invalidate explicitly. So you'll see a whole lot of stars on this slide. Uh, there's some caveats here. Um, when we say forever, we mean as long as your backend will allow. Uh, Different backends and cache servers have different limitations on how long it can actually stay in cache. Uh, in particular, Python memcached, the client interface for a memcached server, won't allow you to set a key forever. Um, you get something like 30 days. Sad face. Um, but that's probably long enough for, for most practical purposes. Um, when we say invalidate, what we want you to do is we want you to set data rather than delete it from your cache. Uh, and explicitly, um, you all should be familiar with uh, import this. So don't issue deletes to purge still data. Um, when you issue a delete, there is this window for another client to request the value, and it's not there, and then you're sad. Instead, calculate the new value and set it. You just overwrite whatever the stale value was into the cache, and, and if you do this, then you'd never experience a cache miss. Instead, you just have this stale value until the fresh value is inserted in its place. And so when you're doing these kinds of updates, if this is going to be an expensive operation, you can even go ahead and do these asynchronously, in which case you should check out Celery. So the next pattern we want to talk about is when you've got a lot of small things. If you have, say, a user table, and you find that you are requesting lookups against your user table a lot, and you want to lighten the load on your database, you can just store all of your users in the cache, keyed by their user ID. Um, and What's easy about this is that the cost of any one of these falling out of the cache is extremely low. You can just do a really 
trivial database query, put the user back in the cache. Um, what's hard about this? Well, there's only two hard things in computer science. One of them is cache invalidation. So let's look at what makes that hard. The first thing you have to think about is, how many keys hold a copy of this object? If this object is a user that we've updated and we need to invalidate across the site, uh, you have to think about all of the things that a user is related to, which in most web applications is going to be this huge set of your domain application. Um, you need to look at how many keys hold a value derived from this object. Um, you need to think about how does updating this object affect which keys it caches into. So if you are creating cache keys that are based on your user's name, for instance, then when you change this name, you need to update both the cache keys for its name before the update as well as its name after the update in order to keep your cache consistent. So I have an idea. Let's list which cache keys this object affects and put that list into the cache, right? Well, I mean, I guess. Um, so let's talk for a minute about cache keys um, because this is kind of the building block for this whole process. Um, so when you want to construct your cache keys, um, we want to make good cache keys. And what makes a good cache key? They should be unique. Obviously, if you have two cache keys that have different values that you're trying to set both into your cache, it's, it's a hash table, effectively, right? It's just a huge hash table. And so if you have two different values mapping from the same key, one will win. And the other one that is trying to retrieve some type of data will be very confused when it gets data that is not what it tried to set. Um, one way that you will try and kind of prevent this problem is through a sort of hierarchical expansion of keys. So you might prefix keys with the component of your application that they're used. So this might be my you know, user DB, user three. Um, and when we want to do this, we want to use separators between these components that we are sure will never appear in the values. Um, if you have a separator that appears in the value, there's this chance that you will have overlap between different segments of this hierarchical keychain. Um, and that will be a, a real big mess for you later. So try and make sure that you can figure out some kind of character that you can use as a separator that won't appear in any of the other values that you're using to construct this key. Um, and make cache keys well-defined. So when I say well-defined, um, the first thing I mean is you should always include all of the components of a cache key, even if they're empty, strings, none. Um, you want to be really consistent in generating your cache keys. This is the way that you will avoid yourself a lot of insanity later as you're trying to debug things and figure out which, key, which keys have which data. Um, you want to use a defined format string instead of trying to construct your key ad hoc. Um, and we don't ever want to write the same format string more than once in our code. We want to stay dry. So you can kind of see this example where on one side we've got this key that we're constructing um, and it's using this like additive method where we're maybe taking parameters to this function and kind of putting them into the key. Um, and in the end, we have this computed value for our key. But it's not entirely obvious kind of how this thing was derived, what parts are or aren't missing here uh, if this key has optional components. So instead, we have this second form where we've got a string format, uh, a format string. Uh, and we simply interpolate that through a dictionary. And then it's very clear when you're looking at this, okay, which of these values um, are what? Uh, this is a user and some kind of point. Uh, and the generated key will be the same every time uh, for any combination of values. Um, so we don't want to define the same format string more than once. So we create something called a key file. Um, Basically, if you have these cache format strings littered throughout your code, which is, you know, you start by, I'm using this cache function here, let me define this format string in line in the function. And then you realize you need it somewhere else in some other component of your app that needs to interact with the same type of object. And so you leave these things littered in your code, and then you start importing them so that you can use the format string, and then you've discovered this awesome circular import hell. Um, so instead, try taking all of your app's cache keys and putting them into a dictionary uh, first of all, that maps these things to descriptive names. Um, and second, this will just be this master list of all of the cache keys that your application uses, or at least all of the format strings that your application uses. This is great for a couple of reasons. Um, this is going to make it really easy for any developer that you onboard to take a quick look and understand the scope of what things you're caching. This is going to make it really easy for them to look and see, is this thing being cached already? Instead of trying to dig through lots of you know, ORM logic or trying to identify where you're doing this caching, they can just look at the key file and immediately know somewhere in our app we are already caching this object. Um, I can use that existing key. Um, 
So when you're using these kinds of keys, when we're constructing them, we also have some, some neat ways that we can manipulate them to make our app a little more robust. Um, so versioning your cache is this great tool that we have where you simply add a version string somewhere into your, your cache key. Um, and so one thing that is a, a way to think about this is imagine that you have some kind of uh, object, let's say a, a user object, and we want to um, add a field to this user's database representation. Maybe we have decided that we want to start collecting Twitter handles. And so we run a database migration. We you know, maybe fill in some of these based on existing data that we have. And now all of the values that we have for users in our cache are stale, because none of them have this field for a Twitter handle. So the best way that I've found to do this is to version all of my data sources. So in this case, I version the user model. And when I add a field to this, I increment that user model's field uh, version number. And then when I'm doing key requests that are constructed for something that contains user objects, I know that I can use this new version, and I won't get stale users back. This is the downside of instantly invalidating huge parts of your cache if you have a lot of cached objects that are based on this model. Um, so this is the trade-off where you kind of have to look at how much is it acceptable for me to have still data versus how much is it acceptable for me to um, have huge cache invalidation problems. Another thing you can do is you can hash keys before they go into your uh, backend. So imagine that you're using memcached, for instance. Memcached has some serious limitations on your keys. They can't have spaces in them. They have to be ASCII. They have to be 255 characters or less. Um, so if you're constructing complicated keys, you can really easily run into this problem where your key is not compatible with this particular scheme and isn't going to fit into your cache backend. So instead, you can just apply a hash function to your key, something like SHA-1. And by doing that, you will keep all of your keys inside the allowable character set. They'll all be in the required length. Um, so that's a, just a tool that you can use to make sure that you don't experience a ton of these errors. Um, so the next pattern I want to talk about is one that uh, is the publish cache. Um, so the idea is that you're building some kind of service that is returning a result to a user. And this service is potentially expensive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the result of one of our service calls. Uh, this might be you know, an API hit. This might be something that's rendering a web page. And we can take the entire response of that query, and we can put the entire response into the cache. And the next time someone makes this request, we can fulfill their response without ever actually hitting our application. So that's great, because it removes load from not only your application servers, but all of the other steps that, that might do, things like third-party APIs, databases. Um, so this is great because it's really easy. Uh, in the web, this is just a piece of drop-in middleware. Um, in the other cases, we've got uh, things like Varnish or Squid that you can just drop into place to do this front-end caching. Um, and invalidation can be kind of easy uh, for some of these things. So imagine that you're caching your blog, for instance. Um, it's unlikely that your blog updates all that frequently. And so it's fairly trivial to, when you update your blog, to go on and invalidate the keys. Um, some things make this hard, though. If you have dynamic chunks on this page, if you've got like a custom header for the users, like, welcome, Noah, um, then you have to start doing these like, kind of dynamic insertions into cached blocks. And that can get kind of tricky. Um, and sometimes these invalidations are really hard. Uh, imagine if you are trying to do a user profile, for instance. Um, every time something updates that user object, you have to kind of invalidate that. Uh, and any time someone does something that affects another user, it's going to kind of be this like chain of dependencies to invalidate these kinds of caching. Um, so that's kind of one of these places where something like Varnish or Squid is a really useful tool. Uh, so I would recommend checking those out if you're considering this kind of an approach. Um, but it's a, a valuable pattern if you can kind of think it through and make sure that this is serving slightly stale data is going to be OK. Um, so I'm going to move into a little bit of some, some best practices, kinds of tips and tricks now. Um, so one thing that I've seen a lot is a pattern that looks like this. Um, and so what's happening here is this is particular example is, is a Django example. Uh, so we've got a query set. Uh, or a, a model, and we try and get an object from this model. Uh, if you're not familiar with Django, this is basically doing a, a query against a database. Um, so this is something that we could conceivably want to cache in order to reduce load on our database server. Um, and 
when we do this, we start by trying to fetch a result from the cache. And if we don't get a result, we go on and perform this database query. Now, what's not necessarily obvious if you're not familiar with Django is that this database query can raise an exception, which is this object does not exist. And if we catch, if we don't catch this exception here, um, it bubbles up to the caller, which is great because then the caller can intercept this and perform all kinds of application-specific logic of what should I do in the event that this object doesn't exist. But we never reach this line where cache.set is going to take the result and put it back into the cache. So whenever we are doing this kind of query where the object that we're querying for doesn't exist, we're not setting the cache. And so I'd like to, to imagine this scenario where I'm Kim Kardashian, and I have 13.8 million followers on Twitter. And I tweet a link to your website, um, but I'm Kim Kardashian, and so I have a typo in it. And now all of a sudden, you have millions of people that are attacking your servers, and none of them are, are returning objects that exist because I've tweeted a link to some page that has a, a malformed URL. And so every time you're trying to perform this get, you're hitting your database. Um, so this is an example of a way in which this pattern can be really harmful to you if you are not res uh, caching the fact that this object doesn't actually exist. So here's kind of a, a, just a slightly better pattern. Um, we just have this kind of marker of this thing doesn't exist. Uh, and so we can now directly raise the exception um, for it does not exist on our own without ever invoking the database if we've gotten that result from the cache. If the result from the cache is none, meaning the cache has no knowledge of this thing, then we can go on to try and perform the get um, and here you'll see that we're just caching this exception of the does not exist, um, setting the value does not exist for this object into the cache so that the next time someone hits this, we don't have to hit the database. And then we re-raise the exception. So the caller um, has no idea that anything underneath here, under the covers, has changed. But we can prevent this whole class of cache misses that are resulting from objects that don't exist. Um, so you can see that really the root of this problem was that before the return value from the cache was none, which was overloaded. Uh, it meant either this thing doesn't exist or it's not in cache and you have to go look it up. Um, so that's uh, kind of a, just a, a slightly improved way. Um, when you're looking at where you're going to put this cache-related code, this is uh, something that's really uh, easy to kind of start littering your code all over with these caching calls. Um, and I want to really recommend that you try and avoid this. Um, when you start, right, you'll see, okay, I have this one template block that takes forever. I'll just wrap that in a cache. Or I have this view that takes forever. I'll just stick caching logic right in the middle of that. Um, I want you to avoid putting caching logic in your templates. Um, I want you to avoid intermingling it with the persistence layer. Um, when I say avoid intermingling with the, with the persistence layer, uh, this is things like um, Django's model.save. Uh, you want to really separate your concerns here between your canonical data source and your cache layer. Um, because remember, we want these to be components of a greater system. We don't want to rely on our cache. If the cache goes down, this shouldn't break things like mm, saving an object. And we want to write code that's dry. We want to write functions that we can use over and over again so that we can avoid writing this cache code as much as possible. So here is just a couple of uh, existing tools. Uh, these ones are all specific to Django because that's the, the background that I'm from. Um, but these are some neat tricks that hopefully either you can use or you can draw inspiration from as you are working on your own cache architectures. Um, so Django new cache is a, a kind of a cool tool. Um, a lot of this thing's features have been adopted into recent Django uh, versions, um, but it has a really neat trick related to thundering herd mitigation. Um, so if that's a problem that you're seeing, uh, go definitely go check out new cache. Um, Johnny Cache is a tool that is going to automatically cache all of your database reads. Um, and so that's a kind of a neat trick um, in that it works at a slightly lower level of your stack so that it's the database queries that are getting cached rather than kind of the objects that are being returned. Um, cache Machine is a, a cool tool. Um, it caches all of your fully evaluated query sets. Uh, and then it stores a list in the cache of all of the objects that are related to any other object so that when one gets updated, they can all get eliminated. I feel like that's a little weird, but um, it's a, a, a neat way if you are thinking about going that route that you can draw inspiration from. 
Um, and I've written a tool called Django AutoCache, and this generates cache managers for you that will automatically cache every individual model instance as well as all of the relationships between models. Uh, so this just follows foreign keys and creates these kinds of persistence layer uh, in your cache. Um, so just a, a little bit of last minute advice before I, I leave. Um, your cache server should not be publicly accessible. Uh, if you remember reading about this one, um, if you are running memcached, everyone knows that they can look for this on port 11211. And so if I'm port scanning you, that's one of the ones I'm going to look for. And then I'm just going to start guessing at keys that I think you'll be using. Um, and so I can really pretty easily start finding all kinds of data that you may not want me to have. Um, if you need to interact with your cache from non-Python processes, don't use pickle to serialize. This one's tricky because a lot of the existing tools will automatically pickle an object uh, if it's not something like a string. Um, so it's great if you know that you're going to want to do something that is uh, a non-Python process to interact with your data, um, to do something like a JSON encoding of your object instead of pickling it. Um, pickle is really closely tied to Python's implementation. And so if you don't have a, basically a full running Python process, you can't unpickle something without horrendous hacks. Um, so uh, that's, that's really um, about what I've got for you. Um, so uh, I guess we'll open it up for questions. All right, we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions because we finished a couple minutes early. So there's a microphone right here and a microphone over to the right. So if anybody has questions, please come on up and ask away. I'll ask a question. What is the most exciting way that you hurt yourself with cash? Um, so I was building this system. And so uh, I was caching um, a number of different things. Uh, so I was caching things like users. I was caching things like uh, what was what's uh, some object that was related to the user. Um, let's call it a page. I was caching pages. Uh, and pages have titles. Um, and I didn't prefix any of my cache keys with things like the uh, type of object that it was. So pages and users, if the page had the same name as a, a username, then they were colliding in the cache. And so I would try and fetch a user and get a page, or try and fetch a page and get a user. And it was really this like, miserable debugging experience until I realized that I was a fool. Um, you had a bunch of points in your slide earlier about uh, you know using separators that don't mix with your cache keys in a format that you know is going to include all your all your fields so that you don't end up with collisions that you're not expecting like structural collisions in your cache keys. Um, and I was wondering if there's a particular reason that you use format strings, you put those format strings in a key file rather than serializing with JSON or wrapper the tuple or you know some, just use some serialization mechanism that you know is guaranteed to not collide. So in general, um, when I'm caching something, I'm deriving its key based on only one or two of its fields. Uh, and in this way, if the, uh, any other field on the object changes, it will still cache into the same key. Um, and by doing that, I make invalidation much easier. Uh, and that's really kind of what it comes down to is, what can I do to make sure that I am creating these in a way that's going to be the easiest for me to identify them when I want to invalidate them later? Um, so if I was doing something like a JSON serialization, then the object's key would be dependent on the entire state of the object. Um, and so if I'm trying to fetch the object, given something like its uh, key that I'm fetching from a URL that's uh, been presented to me, um, that's much more difficult. But it, it, if you were to make a choice between serializing, like JSON serializing just the fields you care about versus encoding in a format string just the fields you care about, is there a, how would you make that design trade off? Um, I, in that case, I, I guess that, well, so I think that JSON encoding um, isn't strictly ordered. And so that can be a, a potential source of some issues as uh, you set this key twice, um, but based on the ordering of the elements in the dictionary, uh, right? Like dictionary ordering is kind of a, a not a well-defined thing, um, unless you're using an ordered dict, in which case you might be fine. Um, but so I, I kind of like this explicitness of having a format string that makes it really clear that um, here is the way that this key is going to look. It's going to look like user, username, some other component. 
Hi, uh, you said not to delete a key when, but instead co compute the value and set the key. Um, so how do you invalidate a cache? Say I, I do have a query set and now some other function has updated that record. Um, how do I mark that key as invalid so the next time I could recompute and set it or something? Uh, so if the key really uh, doesn't exist anymore, if you have deleted some kind of object so that it, you don't want it to appear in your cache, um, then, so first of all, in that case, I, I'd like to try and set some kind of marker that this object doesn't even exist, uh, rather than simply letting the cache return empty. Um, but if I have just updated this object so that uh, the key still refers to the, the same object, but there's been some changes or manipulations to the object that are stored, um, if I can just make those manipulations and then set the value into the cache, then it just overwrites the previous value and you don't have this gap where the key returns uh, none and you have to go and query uh, your expensive operation. Uh, I have one other question about the memoization. Um, the, the idea behind memoization was uh, you store the arguments and then you return the return value if you've already computed the value. Um, what if the function has side effects, if, if it's modifying doing something else in addition? Uh, yeah, so in that case, memoization is probably not the tool that you want to be using. Um, in general, you want to try and kind of separate your concerns into functions so that you can put this memoization around the components that don't have these kinds of side effects. Um, so I mean, like that's really kind of a cop-out answer. Um, the, the real answer is you're building some kind of system that's complicated and you're gonna know kind of what your, your performance needs to be better than anyone who's standing up here can kind of give you guidance. Um, so you need to kind of take all this with the grain of salt and um, build complex tools, uh, kind of using this as guidelines but not rules. Um, Thank you. Sorry, that's such a cop-out answer. I found that um, once I have a cache in place, my code, code base will kind of, in a way, start to depend on it, as far as like just making the same call 18 times, knowing it's fast. Do you have any tricks for like avoiding that, other than maybe just turning the cache off once in a while to see what happens? Um, <laughs> so that's a fun, a fun game to play, when you start discovering all the places where you're gonna hurt when you don't have a cache. Um, but I, I think that this is one of those places where uh, I like to use a combination of tools. So if I have some value that's expensive to compute, um, I'll put that into my cache. But then if I'm invoking that multiple times within a given uh, request, for instance, in a, in a web page uh, sub request response cycle, um, you can memoize the results. And so you do one request to your cache and then have the memoize version inside your process so you've got quick lookup um, and you're not invoking your cache many times. So this was a talk uh, a lot about uh, caching internal to your application. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, cache strategies uh, insofar as they would precede your application, either on a system level dealing with requests before stuff hits Python or uh, putting cache into your WSGI processes before uh, your application uh, starts running a lot. Yeah, so if you can uh, do these kinds of things, it's a, it's a great way to in completely avoid stressing your app and then all the things that your app is gonna invoke. Um, and so uh, there's some tools that are already existing. Um, check out Varnish and Squid. Uh, these are upstream caches that just sit between your application and the outside world and will intercept requests and basically kind of this man in the middle that will return a response if they think that they can fill it from their cache. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a cool tool. Um, you can also do things like if you have an entire response object, right? This is the, the publish cache notion where you can put this entire response into the cache. Um, and you can do things like configure Nginx to receive a request, find the response in the cache, and just flush that response back out again. And in this way, avoid hitting your uh, WSGI stack at all. Um, so it's, it's a, a great set of tools when you can use them. That's the uh, last question we had time for. So if anyone else has questions for Noah, come talk to him afterwards. Otherwise, please give Noah a generous round of applause. Great talk. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody.